Shabbat Shalom. This is Shabbat Vayiki. And I'm asking the question today, what does it mean to keep the faith? Back when I was um, young, in the late 60s and early 70s, that was a popular phrase, keep the faith. What did it mean? What did it mean to them? And what should it mean for us? In our readings for this Shabbat, three patriarchs are highlighted. Avenu Yaakov, Melech David, and Rav Shimon Kifa. They each prepare the way for those who will follow them. They challenge the next generation and all succeeding generations, including our own, to make a commitment to the, the faith, the lifestyle, the avodah, the service or work that has been central to their lives. Our father, Israel, Vayaki, and he lived. Having arrived in Egypt, Yaakov could look back over his long, amazing, and eventful life. <clears throat> Pardon me. He was born in Canaan, but he spent more than 20 years of his life outside the land, given by God to his father, his grandfather, and to him. He knew that his own life would soon end in Egypt. And knowing that time was short, he wanted to prepare his children, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, and all the future generations, not only those who were going to live in Egypt, but the far future, for what in some way Hashem had shown him. Those years in Egypt may have been Yaakov's best years, his best years, when he knew that his beloved son Yosef was alive. It says of him, the spirit of Yaakov revived. He had a, a new lease on life, knowing that Yosef was still living. He was proud that his son had been faithful to his instruction, that he had withstood all the tests from enslavement to high public office. Yosef, in the face of every temptation and inducement and coercion, had indeed remained faithful to the God of Avraham, Yitzchak, and Israel. Yaakov undoubtedly reflected upon the past, upon where he had been, and those whom he had known and love, as we all do, especially as we get older. He thought about his parents, his beloved grandparents, and his dear wife, Raquel. But he probably also thought about those who had brought difficulty and challenge to his life, his twin brother, Esau, his father-in-law and uncle, Levon. They, too, must have been in his mind, but central to his thoughts was the longest continuing relationship of his life, his relationship with Hashem. Recalling the birthright he had purchased from his unbelieving brother, 
looking back to his first meeting with Hashem at Beit El and God's promises to him, all fulfilled, and to Peniel, where his name was changed and he was given renewed knowledge of his standing with Hashem. God had prospered Yaakov and his family, even in Lavan's house. And God had restored to him his son, Yosef. God had provided for him and his family in Egypt. <clears throat> they had sent Yosef miraculously to prepare the way for him and his constantly expanding family. He'd been given the knowledge that his family would sojourn in Egypt, but that one day God would restore them to the land which was their eternal inheritance. These thoughts must have caused him to consider the next generation. And in fact, in our Midrash, it even suggests that he opened a school and, um, and taught. And of course, he would have had plenty of people to teach his great grandchildren, his great, great grandchildren. We don't know how many, but certainly there would have been plenty to, to teach. He thought of the next generation and the future of his expanding family. Our sages tell us that Yaakov spent the remaining years of his life teaching. And what better occupation for a Jew? The story used to be told that when someone talked about wealth, they would say, well, you know, the czar, the czar is wealthy. Many of us lived in Russia. The czar is very wealthy. And then the Jew would reply, but if I was the czar, I would be wealthier still because I would do a little teaching on the side. Teaching, one of our great occupations. But what of the next generation? Well, knowing that his father's time was short, Yosef, who was now the acknowledged head of the family, as his dreams had foretold, went to see his father. But he didn't go alone or without purpose. He took with him his two sons by Asenath. Asenath was an aristocrat, the daughter of Potipharri, who was a priest of the sun god Ra and a major politician of Heliopolis, whom Pharaoh had given to Yosef as his wife. He took with him Menashe, his elder son, whose name means made to forget, because God had made him forget the suffering of his youth. And he took his younger son, Ephraim, meaning fruitful, because God had made him fruitful in the land of his exile. Yosef went seeking blessings for his sons from the patriarch. This was a customary act of respect, an acknowledgement of the necessity of continue, continuing and the continuity of the generations and our heritage. By overcoming the challenges of Egypt, Yosef had matured in a way that is only possible through difficulties 
and trials. Yaakov shared with Yosef and his sons for the first time or maybe for the hundredth time the way in which God had spoken to him at Bethel, providing personal blessings for Yaakov all the days of his life and declaring that Hashem's promise of blessing and provision of the land of Canaan would belong to Yaakov's children forever. Upon this visit, Yaakov declared his intention to adopt Yosef's two sons, Ephraim and Menashe, as his own. What did this mean? Well, it meant that Menashe and Ephraim would share equally with Yosef's brothers in Yaakov's estate. This did not include any other children that might be born to Yosef, but only Menashe and Ephraim. And so, this would mean that Yosef would have a double portion and would be the father of two tribes instead of one. Yaakov's way of explaining this no doubt for the benefit of Yosef's still jealous brothers, was that since Raquel had only two children, this, for her sake, added another son to her progeny. But in reality, this was a prophetic statement indicating that Ephraim and Menashe would father true tribes within the nation of Israel. Yaakov spoke prophetically of God's intentions for future generations. He blessed the younger son, Ephraim, with his right hand, giving him the greater birthright. Yosef was unhappy with this and thinking that Yaakov, whose sight, like that of his father Yitzchak, was not that good, had simply gotten it wrong. But Yaakov told him that Ephraim was to be the greater, not by his choice, but by God's choice. He stated that our people from that time forward should bless their sons with these words. May God make you prosper like Ephraim and Menashe. And to this day, we do that. Yaakov prepared the way for Israel's return to Canaan by telling Yosef that God would restore them to their land in the same way he had promised Yaakov at Beth El that Yaakov himself would return to the land of promise. In doing these things, Yaakov gave Yosef clear precedence over his older brothers, as of course we know he always had. God spoke through the patriarch, Yaakov, establishing these prophetic promises, not only for Yosef and his sons, but for the entire family. After bestowing these blessings upon Yosef and his sons, Yaakov called all of his sons together, and he prophesied over them, describing their character and their future. Each son had the opportunity to examine the character traits described by their father and to consider his ways. Each had the free will 
to change his ways, to strengthen areas of weakness, and to improve upon the points of his strength. Yaakov bear, rejected burial in Egypt. Instead, he made his son's promise to bury him with his father and mother, grandfather and grandmother, on the land purchased by Avraham near Hebron. This, of course, was a reminder to all his sons that Canaan and not Egypt was their home, that they should not put down roots in Egypt. Here was the promise that we would always return to our roots, to our heritage, our land, the land given to us by Hashem. Our future would always be in the land of promise because of our eternal connection with God. As we read in our Haftorah portion, Melech David approached death and he gave this charge to his son Shlomo, who had already been chosen to succeed him. Again, God's choice, already crowned king of Israel, although he, like Yosef, was not the eldest son. With the words of God, he directed his son to be strong and to be a worthy successor. What a challenge. David also told, told Shlomo to deal with the past, to make things right, to correct and to complete matters as needed, and then to get on with being the kind of king God wanted for his people. David said, Obey the laws of God and follow all his ways. Keep each of his commands written in the Torah of Moshe so that you will prosper in everything you do. If you do this, then the Lord will fulfill the promise he gave me that if my children and their descendants watch their step and are faithful to God, one of them shall always be the king of Israel. The challenge to Shlomo is clear and powerful. In order to be a good king, he must obey God and his commands first. God would prosper him and the kingdom that had been left to his keeping, but only if he kept the commands that God had written in his Torah. Shlomo was reminded that upon his diligence rested the future of the Davidic dynasty, the future of our people, the future of Israel. Shlomo was now responsible to set a righteous example in the qualities that made for a good king and ruler according to God's commandments and his specific instructions in personal righteousness following Torah so that the future of his people in our standing with God would be established in holiness. The principle being that no king is above the law of God. And finally, in our Ketuvim Mishikim, we come to Rav Shimon Kifa. Shimon was a true man of God. He was Rav Yeshua's first Talmud. He also became one of two leaders 
of the large Jerusalem Kehillah and the leading Shaliach to the people of Israel, both in the land and in the Galut, the diaspora. Rav Shimon was the first person to be directed to take the Besara, the good news of Mashiach Yeshua, to the Goyim. He was a Shaliach extraordinaire. Two letters written to Jews in the diaspora contain Rav Shimon's directions to the next generation, already enduring persecution and trials as Jews. Some were converts, of course, like Cornelius, and as followers of Mashiach Yeshua. Shimon Kifa's words provide assurance for all who would follow him. Here we see confidence in God's rachamim, his compassion and mercy, which Shimon himself experienced. We read of a living hope into which we are reborn and which is guaranteed by Mashiach Yeshua's resurrection. We're promised an incorruptible inheritance that is eternal and that is set aside even now for each of us. We are secured in our faith by the power of God until the promise of the resurrection that we await is fulfilled. The trials that come to us are for a season, as were those experienced by Yaakov, David, and by Shimon Kifa himself. But these are cause for rejoicing in light of the hope which is ours. In fact, trials of faith are precious. We're told that they're more valuable than gold, which of course may be destroyed. Our faith, tried in the fire, is purified to the praise and honor and glory of Mashiach Yeshua at his return. Faith enables one to see the one who is invisible, Hashem, and to rejoice with complete confidence in him. <clears throat> Our assurance is based on God's word to us and upon Mashiach Yeshua's sacrifice and resurrection, not on empty promises. Rav Shimon challenges the next generation and all the generations that follow until Mashiach returns. He says in Shimon Kifa Beit 1, Do you want more and more of God's kindness and shalom? Then learn to know him better and better. For as you know him better, he will give you through his great power, everything you need for living a truly righteous life. That's the goal, living a truly righteous life. What is the challenge to us? We're reminded throughout the scriptures, that we must pay attention to the lessons of the past. Because all of scripture is given for our admonition. We have the examples of Yaakov and Yosef, who, with the knowledge they had been given, followed God, not only spiritually, but physically. 
They had complete emet and bitakon, faith and trust in his promises. Promises that were not written down. But they believed that he would do all that he said he would do in their lives and in the lives of those who would come after them. When we find ourselves in Egypt, in places of spiritual darkness like Yosef, we can remain aloof from the qualities of Egypt, the paganism, the evil around us, and demonstrate righteousness even there. Yosef is our example. If we have been influenced by Egypt as our people, or even seduced by it, we should not despair by returning to God, by doing Tushvah, tushva, we not only emerge from the darkness, but we gain the spiritual advantage that results from overcoming spiritual adversity. As we read the testimony of King David, which sadly Shlomo observed but did not follow, we see that David's relationship with God stood the test of time and trials, his evil inclination, and God's restoration. He is such a wonderful example for us. When confronted with his sin, he humbly accepted culpability and God's discipline. This was the basis of his restored and renewed relationship with Hashem. We read that David walked with God all the days of his life. Isn't that what we would like to have said of us? Shlomo sought wisdom from God but he didn't make use of it when it was given to him. Instead, he put himself and his human appetites and desires first. He disobeyed God's very specific commandments regarding having too many wives, and his wives were also pagans. He sought wealth for himself instead of for Israel. His life is a, a testimony to failure. Failure to live righteously and follow God. Failure to set a good example for his own sons. Failure to be the kind of king Israel needed and God required. And so we see that the consequence of Shlomo's life was the destruction of a united Israel. Shimon Kifa's life was a narrative of first century faith and faithfulness. His life's avodah, his service, was sharing the Besorah, the good news of Mashiach Yeshua with our people. His legacy is revived in our faith. His teachings are as relevant today as they ever were. And in fact, we studied them recently. His life is the testimony of one who not only talked the talk, but walked the walk. This is a man who kept the faith. We see today many challenges. 
We're not the next generation, but we may be the last. And the first challenge that is entrusted to us is to keep the faith. The faith of the patriarchs, of Yaakov and Yosef. Faith that God will keep his promises to his people as he always has and always will. The faith of Melech David, that as God promised, one of his lineage would sit on the throne of Israel forever, encourages us to look ahead with great anticipation to the soon return of Mashiach Yeshua, Israel's eternal king, who will restore David's kingdom. The faith of Rav Shimon Kepha, human like us, but whose life and teaching offers hope, encouragement, and strengthening in the face of whatever the world throws at us and even in the face of our own failure. Through the men and women who've gone before us, that great cloud of witnesses written of in Ivritim, we have absolute assurance that the promises of God will be fulfilled in each of our lives. Keep the faith means that we must walk and talk and live out our lives with absolute assurance because our confidence is in Hashem alone. The legacy of Rav Shimon encompasses the, the heritage and the testimonies of Yaakov and David and of all the men and women who have followed God and gone before us, Shimon says this, I plan to keep on reminding you. And of course, every time we read his two letters, we are reminded of these things, although you already know them. Because the Lord Yeshua and the Mashiach has showed me that my days here on earth are numbered and I'm soon to die. But I intend to keep sending these reminders to you, hoping to impress them so clearly upon you that you will remember them long after I have gone. And we do. For we have not been telling you fairy tales when we explain to you the power of the Lord, Yeshua the Mashiach, and his return. My own eyes have seen his splendor and glory. So we have seen and proved that what the prophets said came true. You will do well to, play, to pay close attention to everything they have written. And of course, that's one of the things we're doing in studying and unwrapping the prophecies of Zechariah. For like lights shining into dark corners, their words help us to understand the wonderful truth of the prophetic words. Then the light will dawn in your soul. And Mashiach, the morning star, will shine in your hearts. Our legacy, our inheritance, our heritage, our roots. We are required to teach them diligently to our children. The next generation however many remain before Mashiach Yeshua returns. Only God knows the future. 
but may each of us respond to the challenge before us, whatever it is, in the same faithful way as the patriarchs and matriarchs of Israel. May we be found faithful. Shabbat Shalom.